If you enjoy watching Regaining Food Sovereignty online, please consider making a tax-deductible contribution at lptv.org. Your support makes this web content possible. Thank you. Regaining Food Sovereignty is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. What is that? A story about food. Story about food? Yeah. Mm. This is a story about food. It's about our relationship with food as indigenous peoples and as all human beings. Buju Chinodinikwe Indigenikas. My name is Simone Senegals. My family is from the Red Lake Nation here in northern Minnesota, and I work at the Indigenous Environmental Network on our food sovereignty program. We all know that Indigenous people suffer disproportionately from health problems such as diabetes and heart disease. But why is this? It's not as though we are naturally unhealthy. And just a few generations ago, these diseases were virtually unknown. And it's not just about personal choice. It's the result of a corporate controlled global food system that values profit over human and ecological health. And it's the result of genocide, colonization, and the disruption of traditional ways of life, language, and culture. Uh, we find that there's a correlation with the issues of environmental and toxic contamination environmental destruction, and it's linked to building sustainable communities. As we started to address the issues of climate change and global warming, we found that based upon looking at our prophecies, looking at traditional stories and having conversation with our spiritual leaders, that the time has come that we have to be very focused on addressing many different issues that confront us today. We need to change our diets. Today it's just heat and serve. These traditional foods were given to us for a reason, because we can go out there and eat it. They'd rather go to McDonald's or Burger King. We're not a very healthy society. All the foods now in the stores with all the preservative has made our people really, really sick, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and physically. Our people are dying. Fry bread is not a traditional food. It came with the commodities. Many indigenous peoples are effectively challenging the corporate controlled food system, facing a painful past as well as drawing from the strength and vibrancy of that past to create a healthy future. Hunters and gatherers, gardeners, elders and youth, tribal leadership and community members are taking up their responsibility and exercising their power. There are people that are asking for information about our traditional foods and medicines even the younger people and the younger families, they want to know, because that's the way to go. I knew my relatives were smart. They made a living off this tough country, and they survived and thrived. And why can't I? Yeah, it's pretty magnificent stuff that our ancestors passed down to us. And it's our honor to carry them forward, you know, to share them. You need to be active. You need to grow your own food as much as possible. I would like to just really get the word out there on the usage of uh, the indigenous foods. It's about, you know, Mother Earth. It's not about us like we think. You know, it's about her because we're just along for the ride. I've been sober for 17 years now. If you can believe that. I took an oath in front of the Creator that I will never poison my body ever again. It ruins lives, shortens lifespans. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm all out of chuns. I gotta run to the store. The Indigenous Environmental Network is an environmental justice organization. Tom Goldtooth is the executive director. As we look at a corporate food system, we're looking at an industry that uh, is looking at uh, the bottom line of profit. And one of the surprises that uh, many of us have had as we look at what we eat, for an example, is that you know, we have food that has been genetically modified. It's been genetically modified, genetically engineered. For an example, you know, some of the tomatoes that we see on the shelf at our local grocery stores look really nice and fresh and the skin is nice and smooth, it's shiny, but it's been engineered with hormones from, from, from pigs. And, you know, so we're part of a, of a big movement uh, where 
We feel that all people, native people and non-native people, have a right to know what they eat. A lot of the introduction of genetically engineered organisms, including foods, really is a hit and miss system. We need to know what we eat, but even if we know we're eating genetically modified organisms, there's no really safety protocol systems that are developed to really monitor and to evaluate um, you know, these uh, Frankenstein type of foods that we have. It's something where I've consulted with a lot of the spiritual leaders and, and elders and about uh, genetically engineered foods and, and they say that uh, it has no spirit to it. It's a manipulation of the sacred and it's something that uh, within our native indigenous values it's corrupted. So that's why you know we have a food sovereignty program that gives the power back to our people to be able to have free choice in, in what we eat, but also to challenge a bigger system by growing our own food and having the ability to gather and to hunt and to fish, and also to utilize both traditional indigenous as well as modern local growing methods. That's what we're trying to do as one of the goals to build healthy communities because just eating these uh, processed foods with sugar and, and all these other things that we don't, we don't need in our system is, 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 is actually hurting our, our people. 25.8 million people in the United States, 8.3% have diabetes, and it's estimated that 79 million have prediabetes. Diabetes and cancer these days is, is all over. It's like rampant, and I think it is all food related. I've had four heart attacks in my life. I got three stints in my heart. I grew up on bacon and hamburger and McDonald's and all the, all the not so good stuff, you know, and, uh, and that was another reason I wanted to, to do something for myself. I like it here, I like, and I like it when I'm healthy, and I'm taking responsibility for my health and my heart and my lungs. And but I think that's where we're getting sick from, especially sugar diabetes that we eat nowadays. At nearly 16.1%, American Indians and Alaska Natives have the highest age-adjusted prevalence of diabetes among all U.S. racial and ethnic groups. I know when we were growing up, we never seen no people that were overweight, but nowadays a lot of people are just overweight because of the, the foods we eat, mainly, you know, fried foods. Hamburger is okay once in a while, but it shouldn't be the main course. Meat should not be the main course anymore. We find meat contributes to cholesterol and obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and just a slew of things, respiratory, every, everything actually. That saying, you are what you eat, is pretty much correct. Everything is too easy to get. I want this, run to the store. Yeah, just like, go get some pop. Yeah, go get me some, bring me some chips. You know, that's, that's the easiest thing, you know. All you have to do is go to the store, buy what you want. We can walk into the grocery store and purchase almost everything that we traditionally had hunted, fished, or gathered. It gave them those old time grapes. They used to be along the cliffs, those old time grapes. Now they're being replaced by the stores now. I don't know where they buy them grapes from nowadays that you buy from the store. I see a lot of high processed foods being served to our young children in the form of frozen pizzas, frozen dinners, fast food. The food industry is lying to everybody because they're so rich to that. They can do all these commercials. Pay attention to your commercials. You know, you don't see anybody advertising broccoli. You see them advertising McDonald's and McDonald's, chips and pop, um, pastry strudels and all that stuff. And that's not good for you. It's all processed, but they have a big budget. The food nowadays got so many chemicals in it, you don't know what to eat. Egg, 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 eg
Iwi Sidniwin. 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 Iwi the alchemicals from that food nowadays. But when I was growing up, we never used to use that. Despite all the money, power and influence of industrial agribusiness, multinational biotech corporations and the fast food industry, people are returning to traditional foods and they are supporting one another along the way. Our traditional foods and medicines that's what's right for our bodies, that's what's right for our DNAs. And then the processed food is what's getting us sick, you know, it's causing us to, even, even our spirituality, even our minds, our emotions, that affects all of that stuff. And so we really need to get back to the traditional medicines. And, you know, I know it's, it grows in everybody's yard. You know, the simple dandelion, people spray chemicals on there to get rid of them. But the dandelion is a much, richer vegetable than even spinach. Well, spinach is full of iron. This dandelion has way more iron. Any leafy green has calcium in it. It's loaded with calcium. Because you know, you didn't see our, our tribes walking around with a milk cow you know, in their camp. We got our calcium for our bones and teeth, strong bones and teeth, through our leafy greens. And it's much natural for us. You know, a lot of our people are lactose intolerant because we're allergic to milk. You know, the dairy industry is so rich. They have so much money that they can advertise and make these big, beautiful, energizing, happy commercials about dairy and milk. But we're just being fooled as people. And we're being fooled to buy it and to consume it and when it's not good for us. Our people got their calcium from the green leafy vegetables. And, and and that's what works naturally in our bodies. For thousands of years, indigenous farmers have been cultivating seeds and plants that are best suited to both the lands and the people here. We believe that seed knowledge is handed down from within our families. In some areas, it's handed down within our dodims, our clans. And this is something that there's no ownership. The concept of ownership is really a foreign concept. The corporations own. These, these seeds, and the bottom line is profit. They can manipulate the genetic information in these seeds, and it's very important to, to preserve our traditional, our native seeds, uh, because that's something that was given to us by the Creator to utilize, and uh, we are opposed to uh, the ownership and the patenting of our food system, because it becomes corporate-owned and not people-owned. I think it's really okay to rely on yourself and the members of your community to grow your own food. I don't think you have to rely on, on these big agricultural conglomerates and companies. You know, we could talk about how the agricultural companies got a stranglehold on, on, on the food supply, and they do, and how Monsanto's got the squeeze on the seeds, and they do, but there is a way to take your power back, and that's what I'm doing here. You know, Monsanto will not come here and take my seeds. They just won't. And the agricultural companies, they can't stop me from doing this. I grew up on the plains of South Dakota near Pine Ridge. Um, my grandfather took us out quite a bit, um, hunting, gathering, grabbing stuff, and we utilized a lot of food um, when I was young. I realized as a chef, there was no sense of Native American cuisine at all. It came down to Indian tacos and fry bread. And anybody who can look um, into the past a little bit can see that came about, you know, just after people were put on reservations and given government commodities. Um, all they could do with government flour was make dough and fry it up. And for some reason, it'd be stuck, and that's just the way it is. Um, but very unhealthy with the amount of fat that's going into that dish in particular and how um, traditionally it just had nothing to do with some of these northern tribes at all. And if you think about our, our, our indigenous people, you know, 200 years ago they had nothing but that diet. They, they never had no health problems. Traditional indigenous foods and diets ensured that we were healthy, but forced relocation, 
broken treaties, commodities, and colonization immediately compromised our health. I don't know where the Indian got their flowers from. Well, the uh, government uh, commodity program you know, it was contrary to our work ethic. We were very busy people. We lived with the land and from the land and were very respectful. We became dependent and also along with that came a lot of health related issues. Uh, heart disease, diabetes, cancer. We attribute a lot of that to the, the government food programs, obesity and, and those type of things. And it just uh, turned our attention away from more natural, uh, wild and organic foods to a dependency on the federal government program. I learned that they're the same as us because they were being brought into a reservation, same as us. So I thought we were the only tribe that had that issue, but we found out everybody, every nation is like that. The BIA, the uh, missionaries, and the public education system up here disrupted our, our way of life here and we were put on the reservations. And along with the treaties, of course, came the commodities and the commodity program. They've made, you know, laws and rules to that prevent our people from being healthy. We got to buy license now to hunt before we used to be able to hunt and fish anytime to feed our families. Now we have to follow everybody else's laws and rules and it's hard for those that live off the reservation. And also we'd like to bring a lot of our people back and um, share all the natural things that Mother Earth has to offer. Approximately 15 years ago, our lake was placed in a moratorium to restock the lake for the Red Lake walleye. And that's an entire generation who was not exposed to or had the experience to fish the lake using a net for th that many years. Our way of life was disrupted. We didn't go out and we didn't hunt anymore. We still got fish, but we didn't hunt as much anymore. We didn't uh, plant uh, uh, our gardens as much anymore because commodities sort of replaced all that. And we were told this and told that, and our language was, was, was suppressed, and the culture was suppressed, the ceremonies were suppressed. All those things were suppressed. So. Uh, gradually, many people uh, came to rely on commodities. I remember commodities coming in in the 60s, you no know, chopped meat, uh, uh, cheese, brick uh, cheese, you know, and all these other items that uh, were, were processed food that was really hard on. It caused a lot of problems for health problems for our people. You know, growing up with lots of commodities, I missed out on a lot of foods. Um, <laughs> I didn't enjoy cheese for a long time, uh, nor salmon, because I thought it came from the can. It tasted like that to me ever since uh, up until my 20s when I had it fresh. Um, but, you know, I think the biggest impact is the health impact that we see um, with a high rate of diabetes that uh, anybody on the reservation is going to be close to. First, uh, I want to say that fry bread is not even a traditional food. It came with the commodities. but it sustained us. That's why we're still here and strong today. <laughs> they made us a promise in the treaties that they would provide for us because they took away our way of life. And, um, and they did, but with this low quality, quality food, now we know it is. At some point, we weren't able to eat anything else, but you know, we're still here and strong today, as I said, because we had to survive on the commodities. I don't remember eating fried bread too much. But I know we had a lot of uh, outside bread. That was, that was good. Although indigenous peoples have been subjected to foreign diets, we are now finding our way back to our own food systems. We need to get back to our traditional diet because all this other stuff is what's getting us sick. Like, uh, you know, our, uh, the frying pan was introduced to us in the 1800s along with the uh, commodities. And with the commodities you get that uh, white rice, white pasta, white flour, and that's totally not good for our DNA. And that's what just getting us, our people sick. And we have this diabetes epidemic. And um, you know, if people got back to eating what's natural to our bodies, to our DNAs, we'd be fit, healthy, strong people again. <laughs>
I think the traditional foods were the best. Our store was outside in the woods. That's where all our food came from. Traditionally, our foods that we hunted, gathered, and fished were a primary source of sustenance and contributed to the overall health of the Anishinaabe. The Red Lake Traditional Food Program, our saying is always for today's health, and we really like to emphasize the uh, today's health. If you get out there and do things the old way, which means you're not going to the store and buying frozen food or, any, or pop or soda or chips or anything, you're going out and you're getting your own food, uh, you're taking care of it and you're preparing it, you bring it home and you cook it your own self and it's, it's traditional food and it's good. And I know people are learning or wanting to know about our traditional foods and medicines and I think that's where our future is going because people are asking for it. The berry picking, harvesting, making maple syrup that lasts all year. When we pick berries, we can them and all the natural foods, it's none of the commercial food. There's no pesticides and things like that in all our food gathering, as opposed to commercial berry picking and you know all the spraying and stuff that they do on their plants. Wild rice is good, it's, it's good for you. Fish is good, game is good. We have so much fish here and it's so healthy for you. People years ago were generous with each other. They shared their food. They took care of their elders. If their elders didn't have the food, they took it to them, they cooked for them. I've seen my grandma do that many a times. We grew a garden here in the 90s, and this elderly grandmother-in-law, she was like in her 80s. She knew that we grew a bunch of cucumbers, and we had three, 400 pounds of cucumbers, and I told her, I'll bring you some cucumbers, which I did. She loved cucumbers, she ate them up. And I said, I'll bring you some more, and she called me up at 10.30 at night from her home and said, is Bill there, which is my English name? And I said, well, right here, what do you, what do you need? Uh, can you bring my cucumbers over? I said, right now? And she said, yeah, right now. And it was 10.30 at night. So I, I kind of hung up the phone and told my wife about that. And I said, I have to take those over there. I have to take those cucumbers over there, even though it's 10.30 right now. I won't get over there till almost till quarter to 11, but I got a, a little box of cucumbers and I took them over there and delivered them to her because she was an elder lady and I wanted to share those cucumbers with her. So I delivered those cucumbers to her at quarter to 11 at nighttime. And our people have always shared with each other whatever they have, you know, even to this day. My mother was sick in the hospital and we had people coming up there, they were bringing kettles of soup. They're bringing sandwiches. They're bringing fruit dishes. They're bringing, they said, oh, we just want to check on you and make sure you guys are okay up here. Here, we brought you some stuff to eat because we know you are hungry and you just want to be up by, by the bedside of, of your sick mother. And even when we have passings, immediately at the home of the, whoever loses a person, people start showing up. They start knocking on their door, bringing them things that they need. No, they bring them food, they bring them bread, they bring them vegetables, they bring them water, they bring them things that they need because they know that there's gonna be a lot of people sitting there with them, so they need to share, they need to have food, they need to have food to share with people that are coming into their house. And anybody that's uh, short on food, if someone finds out, they will show up at their doorstep with a food pack if they need it, People don't even have to ask, they just deliver it. The Chief Muskokone All Nations Youth Cultural Learning Camp in Red Lake, Minnesota hosts seasonal camps on maple sugaring, berry picking, fishing and hunting for Red Lake youth, as well as hosting cultural exchanges such as the sharing of Anishinaabe fishing culture with Diné youth from the Navajo Nation or a wild rice bison exchange with an extended Dakota family from Yankton, South Dakota. We're having a youth cultural exchange program with Arizona kids. We're going to take the kids fishing. 
went up to the point, Panema Point, and uh, explained the history over there about uh, Red Lakes. And but the Arizona kids don't get an opportunity to fish very much, so. What well, happens when the fish gets it? Oh, you'll feel it when the fish gets it. They went fishing yesterday. They caught some walleyes and bass, and. Hey, we got him! Good job. <laughs> nice job. Blaine was in Vegas with us last year, and he's one of the boaters today, and he's going to be teaching some of the Arizona kids uh, fish. But I see the Arizona got one up on us. They're, they're actually collecting their own bait. So we're going to go out to Thief River and uh, teach them a little bit of history about Chief Muskokan Youth Cultural Camps that we started. Wow, look at that. My tobacco's gone in my truck. I told you about it. Nice, look at that. He, he says we're doing a good thing. Keep it up. See him acknowledging you guys. Wow. It's quite an honor to have him come. It's cool. You're going doing good things when you have an eagle come acknowledge you. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. As soon as I opened my eyes this morning, I said a prayer to the buffalo for the the shooters, for the skinners, and for the people that were going to be cutting up the meat for their safety and strength and endurance and, and spiritual health because you know that uh, that buffalo is our relative and um, you know we don't just um, go out and kill a buffalo and we're good hunters that buffalo offered himself up to us and that's that's how it is anytime anybody goes out and hunts that animal they're giving a giving nation they offer themselves um, not too many people know that but as native people we have known that all along yeah Historically, nothing went to waste. We used the bones for, to make toys for our kids and the hide to make little dolls for our little girls. And even the hoofs were used for, to make cups. And the bones were made into utensils, even like um, combs for our women. It was all used. And we're gonna use it all. And we'll use the skull and the, the buffalo hide in our ceremonies all throughout the year. Yeah, that's kind of how we do it. <laughs> As I grew up, my grandfather used to used to go hunting all the time, and he'd bring deer home. That's what you know. That was our mainly livelihood, and Grandma would clean it up, and we ate almost everything that was on that was in the deer. I and two of my brothers were responsible for snaring rabbits in the winter time. Porcupine, you gotta cut a, a certain way, otherwise it don't taste good. You just ruin the whole, the whole porcupine. So there is a certain way, and I don't think nobody knows how to cut it like that anymore. We should be utilizing a lot of our indigenous foods. I mean, these animals are meant for this region, these regions, they grow well here. And I, I can remember one time, I was just, I was just a little girl, just small, I was little, and uh, I was sitting with this old man. We were sitting by the fire, and he was roasting. Under the coals, mm -hmm. he was cooking duck guts. Mm -hmm. But he really, really cleaned them really nice because I followed him all over. And, I, and then I was sitting there and I was thinking, you know, oh God. Even when I was little, I knew enough to. <laughs> so anyway, he, he cooked them and then he got them out of the, out of the, out of the coal. And I kind of hesitated, I didn't want to, eat them, but he talked me into it, and were they ever good. I remember every morning we could just hear them, morning starting up, people would go after their nuts. When I was growing up, as soon as we could stand up on a fish box, we were required to help in taking care of the fish, the fishing uh, for the family. In those days, they were all allowed, they were all allowed from six to eight nuts per family, but still they cut a lot of fish. We used to eat a lot of fish in my days. 
We used to live by a lake. We used to go around by the lake and we'd go take the turtles' eggs. We never took all of them. We always left one or two so that they would, so that they would, so the turtles wouldn't be a complete loss. You should get you a sucker head. You have sucker heads. Man, that was, that was good normal. Man, I wish I had about three, four sucker heads right now. <laughs> Make me hungry. <laughs> At the White Earth Tribal College's Wild Food Summit, Bill Paulson shares his family's recipe for suckerhead soup. My name literally translates to wind that goes around. I am from the Crane Clan, which means I'm supposed to be a good speaker. But anyway, we're going to make suckerhead soup. Suckers are a carp, considered to be probably a throwaway fish. All of the Anishinaabe culture, we go out and um, harvest them in the spring. Go ahead and pull one out. They're a little bit cold. They've just come out of the freezer. A lot of times I try to get them right close to the head so there's just one row of scales that go around. I usually scrape them on the back of the head when I get them, so should be very few scales. A couple of little scales there, otherwise it looked really good. This is just a little bitty guy here. So I haven't done a whole lot any different than what has always been done. The only thing that I've really changed with sucker head soup in my life is that I tend to add a few more ingredients than most people. I have uh, leek tops, some garlic, some shiitake mushroom, some nettle and leek dried. I'm gonna put in some uh, butter to give it some nice fat consistency with some evaporated milk. We're gonna use uh, wild rice flour to uh, make a little bit of a base. We have a lot of fish and people should include fish more in their diet. It should be maybe twice a week or so. It should be in the diet, and it's good fish. It's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not, the lake is not polluted. Uh, the fish is healthy, and, and the more you eat, the better off you are. When I was talking to my mother, we were talking about fish and white fish, white fish in particular. She told me that when I was a baby, my grandmother used to give me uh, whitefish soup in a bottle. That's what I grew up on, whitefish soup. And, and I, I, th I attribute that a little bit to uh, my good health. And, and though I've been pre-diabetic for 20 years, I still attribute a lot of that to the whitefish that was in my bottle. When we went fishing, it, I had a lot of fun. And I caught a bass. And I didn't know I had caught it until I reeled it in. But it, it was really exciting so i learned like the fishing basics of trolling and how to cast and what type of fish that's in the river like if they're native or non-native things like that and the walleye tasted good the first year i came i won the biggest bass trophy it was a big four pounder and Joey almost won me that day, but uh, mine was a couple ounces bigger. And me and April, I was reeling it in. I thought it was a big northern, and, and it was pulling our boat. And I kept reeling it, and I pulled it out, and I'm like, yes, a bass. And that's the second biggest one I ever caught. And that was the most exciting because it was mine. First year of the Red Lake Youth Fishing League. Me and my friends, we watch the berries. We can't wait till the time is ready. And we organize with our families and children. And it's just something that we look forward to every year, the berry picking. I love it. In berry time, we all got together in the family and went berry picking. Blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, the plums. Chook cherries, June berries and pink cherries. So they can put soak in canum so you can have fruit during, during the winter. There used to be a bunch of these berries at one time. Now they, you don't even see them anymore because of this, uh, this, um, I think it's read them up, uh, this greediness, or this greediness of chopping down trees and clearing up the roads. Every springtime before the snow mountain, we had our own sugar camp. We had our own sugar camp. We used to make syrup, sugar, cakes, and taffy. Then we used to make our own container out of birch bark. 
so you can get that that sap water. So that sap water will drip into that birch bark containers. Now my mom talks about everybody come together and we chopped wood and we boiled sap and we made sugar. You gotta boil it down where you get the, the syrup where it gets thicker. Then you put it in another container and you gotta feather it with, with, a, with a stick and keep stirring it like that. You get the sugar, but if you let it go a little further and then it gets thick, you just pour it in that old container and mm. it hardens and gets like that. My aunt, is, I used to watch her do that a lot. She was really good at that. It takes patience, you know. Uh, and last year, of course, wasn't any good at all. Um, due to the uh, changing climate uh, that we have these days. Uh, the year before, we got some good uh, maple sap, um, and that, that's a good thing. And, and if you use that instead of white sugar or any kind of uh, processed uh, sweetener, uh, maple syrup is what they used to use years ago. You boiled it down until you had sugar cakes, and you could carry those and keep those, and it was good for you. It was much better for you than, than processed sugar. Minomin, or wild rice, is low in calories, fat, and sugar, and contains important nutrients like vitamin B, D, and E, as well as fiber and protein. In fact, studies indicate that people can reduce health conditions like cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and obesity by consuming minomin regularly. What happened in my eyes is that we got a whole bunch of wild rice, and I love wild rice. <laughs> wild rice, uh, we do in the fall. Uh, we go and camp out for a week. We've gotten rice and we've processed it to parch and to thresh and to winnow. And, uh, and that's a good product. And it's all done by hand and it's all very good. And it's, it's actually probably the uh, most healthy rice in the world. I, I, I don't know of any other rice that would uh, top it. Because indigenous peoples respected the interconnectedness of all life, native societies developed unsurpassed skills in living well within the natural world. Skilled at hunting, fishing, and gathering, indigenous peoples of the Americas are also expert farmers and are responsible for introducing such staple foods as tomatoes, corn, squash, potatoes, and sunflowers to the world. It just feels good to bite into a tomato that you grew or, a, or... Anything that you've grown, oh, man, my cabbage was the bomb last year. They were big as basketballs, I'm telling you. And, oh, man, I love cabbage. So, in one sense, you know, it just brings me pleasure. It really does. Um, it gives me a sense of pride, knowing I can do it. And um, it saves me money. And I think for those reasons alone, you know, uh, that, that's more than enough. Yeah, <laughs> We give you two calls on the cooking ticking. What I remember is how I grew up when I used to help plant, plant the gardens. As growing up, I had a lot of vegetables and ate a lot of, a lot of traditional foods. We used to have plenty of a uh, uh, garden of potatoes and corn. Yep, and then you get a bit of those, those, those old time corn, we used to use those all the time. The last two years I've tilled. I have a tractor for my program and a tiller and we've done uh, 20 gardens. As you can see behind me here, I have the Bear Island Flint corn, which is hominy corn. We planted potatoes, corn, Popcorn, watermelons, carrots, beets, peas, beans. That's what they don't kids will be doing during the summer. I, I try to say that to those kids. I said, go find somebody. We get on the koala, give we do koi go. She get to get you, she was too, I get to come, you know. 
And I, well, I just said to her, I said, go find somebody and I'll teach you how to make a garden and plant food. Plant, plant whatever you want to find so you can eat. Food sovereignty basically means that people and not corporations control our food system. And really control is actually the wrong word. It means that we as human beings take up our responsibility to care for the earth as we care for ourselves. Food sovereignty strengthens our relationship to food, which is, which is linked to our ceremonies, our spirituality and our culture and language. As we bring our families and the children into our garden programs, and into our different uh, harvesting practices. We stress the importance of putting up prayer, putting down tobacco. And there's that link that's very important that uh, food is ceremony, food is sacred. Manoman with our Anishinaabe people, our Sea with our Dakota people, it was given to us by the Creator. So we're supposed to be protecting this food as well. We are the guardians of our food system because this food has been given to us in a way the food tells us, use us, we have been created for you to use us. In return, through our reciprocity, we also respect them and honor them. Along with the social health that comes with sovereignty, knowledge of traditional foods as medicines are being revitalized and shared. Food is medicine and medicine is food. And historically, before anybody else was here, before we got visitors, um, Mother Earth provided everything we needed. And so you look around and you see a weed, it's not a weed, it's food or medicine, or both. Um, a lot of them are interchangeable. One of the other elders was talking to me about a partridge. And she said that there's some partridge soup in there, you, you want some? I said, sure. She said, that's medicine food. I said, oh, okay. And she explained to me that, that, uh, that partridge only ate barks, it only ate off of trees, it would all eat all vegetation stuff, and all that stuff that that pirate eats has medicine in it. No medicine properties it has in it. It ingests that into its system, that that partridge, and it would go into that medicine would go into that flesh. So then when you ate the partridge, you're eating that medicine that's in that partridge. And the same thing with all the other animals, the, the deer, the moose, the beaver, the muskrat, the ducks. You know, we wanted eggs, you'd have duck eggs. Even the swamp tea. I have a, a grandmother-in-law. That's all she ever drank. She lived to be, I think it was almost 90. My wife's uh, grandma, and she was always, she was, uh, she was slow in her age, but she was always clear-headed and, and sharp-minded and friendly and humorous, and, but then she always drank tea. And I remember one of the elders telling me, you drink that swamp tea, that's medicine. Just like the cedar, you know, it's all, all this stuff is good for you, you know. Our native people through our food sovereignty program are really breaking loose out of the bondage of colonization. And we're looking at how we can develop a more democratic system based upon our traditional values and respect for the responsibilities we have for the sacredness of Mother Earth is very important. All of life is, is celebrating with us and what we're doing because we need each other. The bird nation, the animal nation, deer nation, we're all linked together. So that's why it's very important that we work together as part of this, this medicine wheel and healing of this medicine wheel that we have we're able to come together, not only as two-legged human beings, but you know, part of food sovereignty is bringing that circle of life together. Food sovereignty means the revitalization of those traditional ways of life that make us a healthy people. Our way of life was changed, altered. We couldn't go out and hunt and gather anymore, and so it was lost, and people don't know the foods and medicines anymore. I knew my relatives were smart. They made a living off this tough country and they survived and thrived. And why can't I? Be active, and, and, and it's a big part of, of the program is to get out and do your own gardens, get out and get your own food, get out and do something, get active, do something. 
Well, we'd like to see more organic farming, seasonal activities where uh, native people are out there with the sweat of the brow working the earth. There's value in that. There's physical benefits and it also uh, gives a good strong family uh, continuity and we like that we need to get back to those type of things and uh, how much time we spend with one another. If I would have bought all the food that I grown and prepared and gave away from my garden I think it would have been a minimum a thousand dollars and a thousand dollars is a lot to anybody and it's a lot of money to me. I love good food. Good food is expensive. Good healthy food is priced out of poor people's price range. This is a way to, to take that out of the equation. This is one less barrier to a good health without having to be you know, well off you know, or, or uh, upper middle class. I don't know how to say it. I don't want to offend anybody. You know, I just, I, some people are born into privilege. That's good for them. Some people aren't. They have to figure out a way to get that good healthy food um, on their own. This is the way I see it. it. You just have to take charge. It's it's good to know about the ways of nature, the ways of creation, you know, to pass them on. I think the retraining people, some of that lost knowledge and be able to go out and get stuff that's right at your back door pretty much um, is important and to get away from cooking things that are in a box and just handed to you or come from a can and just handed to you. Um, why not can your own stuff, you know, build your own gardens, you know, forage your own foods. Um, it's mostly free at that point, you know, and it's easy to do. We do things together. We do wild rice, we do uh, hunting and we do uh, fishing and then we do a garden. I till a garden for him and he grows this and then he makes hominy and he sells his hominy and everybody on the reservation knows that he has hominy all year. It's a good thing, it's a wonderful thing, and it's really nutritious, and it's good, it's good. This is the third year of my program here. I'm hoping to expand in all areas, and I want to work with more reservation people. I want to get a community garden going, probably over at the mission school this year. I'd like to get some people helping to get our own vegetables, provide our own vegetables for the Red Lake Nation, the elderly nutrition, uh, the schools, the schools, I, I really would like to do that uh, farm to school program which they have started over in White Earth there. I, I hopefully can get enough people interested and get something going and we can all get a think tank going and get it going here. My interest is preserving the culture and the traditions, teaching the children about spiritual health, emotional, mental, and physical health, that's what it's all about. Our thoughts are very powerful, yeah. you know, and that's what, you know, we try to do with the smudging, you know, of, of, of the, um, ourselves and also of our relatives. The prayer itself is to recognize his giving of himself, but to recognize his spirit, his soul, and what he came here. To, to fulfill or to accomplish, you know, he's done that. What we did was at that time we said thank you for that. The song that was sung was to thank him for his giving, you know, that his, what he's giving to us, you know, is not going to be uh, forgotten. The relative who, who took his life, you know, he, first thing he got out, well, he had sage in his hand burning, you know, and he went to the, to the a relative there, or the, the day which Hasha, I know this buffalo man, he made a prayer to thank him, you know, and he respected him that way. And every year for the past four years, this business has been conducting under our local elders a ceremony to ask permission and also to give thanks to honor honor our uh, fish nation and show respect for what we have as a nation you know the lakes and all the fish nation in there and the people there's a direct tie with uh, native based uh, food sovereignty programs and language and culture revitalization
No, I'm not afraid to talk Ojibwe, even though Bangi, Tago, Lenetan, Shnabem. No, I know a little bit of Indian. I said, I'm in Wayndan, Gujijigia, we get Ken, Damanan, Shnabem. I said, I'm going to talk Indian if people, you know, if you guys think I'm saying something wrong, I don't care. I'm going to talk Ojibwe. I don't care what anybody says, and that all has to do with sovereignty. Sovereignty, yeah. It'll really create a sense of pride if we can have uh, our own foods and really claim it as our own and be proud of them. It really binds community together. You go to any culture throughout Europe, Asia, anywhere, and, pe and food is what really binds people together. And being a chef, I found it easy to meld into cultures easily and you know find a common place with people knowing their food because it's something that they're proud of and they want to show you when you go and visit. And we can have that too if we all just find what our core is and bring it all back together. If you would like to try some delicious, famous Red Lake Walleye fillets, you can order that online at redlakewalleye.com or you can give us a call at 877-834-2954. You call us today and order your Red Lake Walleye by two o'clock today. We will have it on your doorstep at 10 a.m tomorrow morning. Strengthening local economies is key to exercising food sovereignty, as is the participation in other cooperative relationships across racial and other divisions to foster collective power and continued positive change. Part of uh, food sovereignty to the Indigenous Environmental Network is uh, working with uh, other Indigenous peoples uh, throughout our past 20 years to uh, preserve our traditional knowledge. We always, you know, want to record it as a, a teaching tool, you know, for, for anybody who has questions, anybody who has, has never seen it or experienced it, you know, they have an opportunity to, to, to know, you know, how to, to do this. I uh, truly believe that Native people are Native people and, you know, we're all related. We're not so different, you know, like we thought. We're more unique than we are different. And so if we understand that, then that's how we start to, to heal. Sharing, lots of teaching of uh, Buffalo Kill and, and some, you know, our sun dances, our ceremonies, a lot of them are open here. And, you know, we, we have a lot of non-natives, you know, so it's not just tribe to tribe, or many tribes together, it's many nations that come here. Everything that we're doing is about humanity as a whole, not as just one race, it's all of humanity because our job is to help Mother Earth with her spiritual evolution and the place that she's going to take. My hope for the people uh, of my reservation, Red Lake, and actually all people, I want to say all people, I, I want them to, to take back their own power and their own responsibility for living a good life. I want that for people. I want people to be happy. I want people to be healthy and to live long lives and to watch their grandchildren grow up. and and not suffer some of the diseases that, that an unhealthy diet through these commodities has created. I want them to take their power back. I want, to, I want them to take their lives back. Well, I think both the issue of native foods and organic and wild foods and constitutional reform, they, they both have in common a getting back to the philosophies of the way Native Americans used to live the respect for the land, respect for each other, and the way they conducted themselves out there in nature, in the world, and amongst one another. I think Red Lake should have their own food system. We're, we're, we're big enough, we have enough land, we have enough space, we have enough bodies, we have enough people. I think we have enough uh, brains uh, that we should be able to do this. We have seen this movement of Native people from the communities, families, uh, not only here in northern Minnesota, but also throughout Turtle Island that are coming back to our traditional food systems. And it's been linked to our language and culture revitalization. It's been linked to our ceremonies. Uh, some people are, are listing out the different categories of food systems and what that means within our language. Along with this movement of language revitalization and the bringing back of our food systems it has really inspired me, it has really inspired the work that we do and seeing the voices of the children and the, and the parents and the grannies and the grandpas in our food program has really lifted up my spirit.
Because the bottom line is love. It's what this whole, what we might call two centuries, three centuries is all about. All the teachings are all about love. Now these teachings we have, you know, we're honored to be able to share them. So everybody will know because there's so many people in the world that have forgotten about so about this respect and this power of love, you know, to to know the, 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 that we're all equal, you know. There's no no one above or nobody below each other. You know, we're all on the same playing field. We're equal. The young families are calling and saying, are we going to go get go out and hunt for food or the medicines? Yeah. All right, yeah, we need that. You know, so it's exciting. <laughs> I discovered that there's um, likeness in our culture, like some of our rules are the same as theirs, and um, I'm, we didn't learn all, we didn't, they, we didn't get told a lot about their um, ceremonies and stuff, but some of them might be the same way as ours, so I'm pretty sure we're um, alike in a way. The food gathering and the cultural aspect of this, it, it helps with their self-identity. It makes them aware of who they are and where they're from, and it gives them a sense of, of, of self, of what of worth of being a Native American is about and what their, what their role in society is, and especially within their community and their tribe. We travel and go to conferences, and we even travel um, to other continents and talk about our foods and medicines. I've been doing some research for the last 10 years about uh, the foods and medicines. And it, actually, my first teachers were my um, grandma and my mom. And we would go out and get mushrooms in the fall and then chiaka tea in the spring. And so I honor them and recognize them in our, uh, in our sessions. There's a lot of people who want everything to be um, as traditional as possible, of course. I've looked hard, for sure, for lots of traditional recipes as much as I can. Um, I think uh, in a modern day sense, though, you have to be wise into bringing in some modern techniques with things. But I think most people are extremely receptive to it, both on the reservation and off the reservation, especially the elders, they see the importance of it. I think everybody will down the road once they really understand and grasp the meaning of why it would be important to have a modern sense of Native American foods and the utilization of indigenous plant species. It's about, you know, Mother Earth, you know, and she's going to do her work and take her place in creation. Whether we're ready or not, you know, it's best to be ready, which is why we share, which is why we need to connect on every, every level. Because of the hard work, dedication, and love of the people we've seen here, as well as many others, we are well on our way toward regaining food sovereignty. Miigwech. Regaining Food Sovereignty was made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. If you enjoyed watching Regaining Food Sovereignty online, please consider making a tax-deductible contribution at lptv.org. Your support makes this web content possible. Thank you.